Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Zach. I'm the CTO of um, the Aztec Protocol. Uh, we are a privacy um, solution for the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and yeah, I'd like to talk about a little bit about what we're up to, the technology that we're using, and what it enables, and how to get stuck in yourselves. So, um, so yeah, this is a brief agenda of what the uh, I plan to talk about. Um, tangents, notwithstanding. So basically, what what do, at least do we think are the kind of building blocks that you need to get? confidential digital assets working on the, on, on the Ethereum blockchain specifically, and um, some of the kind of software engineering constraints that um, this specific blockchain platform poses. Um, our attempts to solve them, particularly through our kind of cryptography engine standard, which I'll go to in a little bit, but it's kind of a way of mediating uh, multiple zero-knowledge proofs and how they interact with one another. Um, how to create efficient range proofs, because that's kind of the fundament, one of the fundamental building blocks of the ASIC protocol itself. Um, an example of actually getting Aztec, the Aztec protocol working um, in the real world uh, with, so Joe, um, our head of product, has been building a kind of an example, um, kind of a confidential private loan dApp for Ethereum, uh, which you'd like to showcase. Um, and then finally, just how to get stuck in and create assets yourself, because that's really what we see our mandate uh, as, as giving developers and builders the tools that they need to build um, confidential private um, assets and instruments and, um, and smart contracts on Ethereum without having themselves to be literate in zero-knowledge cryptography or um, having to understand all of the uh, fearsome mechanics that happens under the hood. Um, so um, private transactions uh, on a public blockchain, they are possible. It is possible to have your cake and eat it, um, so to speak, and get a public blockchain to validate um, like the, uh, enjoy the consensus benefits of a public blockchain, um, whilst actually restricting um, the information that that blockchain can, is actually has access to, um, specifically in this context, uh, values of stuff that you're transferring. Um, and um, Xenon's cryptography can be used for a lot of all, uh, like incredibly innovative and advanced um, uh, applications, as, as Mary Mallers uh, just, just described. Um, when we were building the asset protocol, um, we found that uh, kind of there is there is an enormous gap between the kind of what we can theoretically do um, and what we actually want to do, um, and how actually uh, like uh, the and the costs and trade-offs involved. Um, specifically, some of them are obviously um, like uh, the um, if you start to use. Um, freaky zero knowledge technology, you start to get a proliferation of secret keys um, and like um, special cryptographic like, bits of information and witnesses that you need to keep track of and hide. Um, and it's very hard to create um, like application specific proofs. Um, the number of high level languages that compile down to zero knowledge proofs is rather limited and they themselves are not very expressive. Um, and you need to be quite literate yourself in zero knowledge cryptography to use them. Um, there is no real standardization, um, not even on like a, a, a format on um, transferring around rank one constraint systems, uh, just because everybody's kind of just make, like, make, like, making their own standards as they go along, because there's not a lot of coordination. Um, uh, a lot of trusted setups involved. Um, uh, I mean, uh, like we, uh, we, we can get, get it down to one trusted setup with things like innovations like Sonic. Um, but if you want to use more efficient, like more like faster uh, snarks um, with shorter breathing times, then you have this massive proliferation, proliferation of trusted setups. Um, proof construction times are extremely long, and proof verification is extremely expensive. Um, to give an example, just some hard numbers um, that we we were tackling with when putting together our protocol is: if you want to perform 25 elliptic curve scalar multiplications um, through a smart contract on Ethereum, that costs you one dollar in transaction fees or five or six bilinear pairings. Um, so the constraints are, are really quite tight there, um, where uh, quite a lot of um, crypto systems um, that um, are eminently like workable in, in, um, in most applications, where like proof verification times are like uh, on the order of um, you know like seconds, are completely impractical uh, in in a blockchain world. Um, and so, how do we how do we bridge this gap <laughs> between the technical vision? And the reality of um, actually getting this stuff, put, putting this stuff to work with the kind of the um, platforms that we have available to us today. So um, this is kind of our best uh, attempt at creating what we think are the kind of the building blocks for an ecosystem of confidential digital um, applications dApps built on top of Ethereum. You need some way of having customizable confidential transaction semantics. Um, and by that, I mean uh, somebody, a developer or builder, building a private digital asset or building some kind of private dApp. They need to be able to 
um, define custom logic um, that governs like the underlying digital asset or information that they're, that they're, uh, that, um, that they're manipulating. Um, they have, need to be able to do that without actually themselves having to come up with their own cryptographic protocols or be literate in this kind of stuff. Um, you need some kind of cross-asset interoperability. So it's, 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 it's all right if I can create like a private version of DAI or a private version of Ether, but um, that, that only gets you so far. You, you, need, you need a way of having all of these different private digital assets communicating with one another so that I can build a private, confidential, decentralized exchange um, that mediates like um, transfers between multiple different private digital assets and um, that there's some kind of standard by which these can all communicate and that flow can work. Um, you, need really de you need developer friendly tools, and this is always a, a, um, a work in progress because, uh, as anybody here has, who's tr um, tinkered around with zero knowledge cryptography knows, that the, the quality of the tooling is because um, there's, there's like very few people actually working on this, and so you have incredibly dedicated build people building these tools, but just the, the kind of just the lack of manpower is really quite apparent. Um, uh, like tools for constructing these zero knowledge proofs, particularly ones which um, kind of d that abstract away the zero knowledge cryptography side of things, um, they, they are somewhat lacking. Um, and you need really efficient proof construction and verification, particularly um, when building applications for the Ethereum blockchain, because the typical way that um, a consumer interacts with an Ethereum dApp is either through a web browser or a phone, um, neither of which have access to particularly um, fast cryptographic algorithms. If you're using a web browser, you're limited to, at best, WebAssembly, um, so you can have at least a factor of 10x slowdown compared to like, state-of-the-art algorithms compiled to C and Rust. Um, and on a phone, obviously, your resources are much more constrained. Um, and then there's the need for efficient verification because of the, the constraints of gas costs on Ethereum. Um, uh, and, obviously, and also one thing, uh, if you want to use hardware wallets, again, those things are going to be quite constrained as well, so you need efficient proof construction. So how, how on earth do we forge these building blocks, um, given, given, given what we have? So you need a family. Like, what we built is a, a kind of a family of zero-knowledge proofs that all share a common reference string. Um, and so what I mean by this is what we've come up with, what we're putting together at Aztec, because of the, kind of the constraints on Ethereum, um, we've developed a kind of a suite of zero-knowledge proofs that all perform like kind of discrete bits of business logic, the kind of things that you would need to, to create a private digital asset. And you can use them and pick and, mac, uh, pick and mix them in a modular fashion um, to create somewhat like cu custom transaction logic. Um, uh, and this is, um, yeah, this is work quite, working quite well for us um, because the asset protocol does require us to set up, but only one. And we can add, um, continually add more and more proofs over time to our, to our standard um, that we use this trusted setup. Um, we need a kind of a shared suite of validation smart contracts, um, which we're kind of collectively calling our cryptography engine. Basically, um, the kind of a canonical um, suite of smart contracts that validates zero knowledge proofs and acts as the ultimate arbiter of the correctness of a proof. This is incredibly useful because it means then that different smart contracts um, that all require like different zero knowledge proofs, if there's some commonality between them, so imagine your, 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 um, your zero knowledge proof. Um, you have a zero knowledge proof for one smart contract where the kind of the proof statement you're proving is um, also relevant to a second smart contract that they can then share that same proof um, and they can both they can uh, query this cryptography engine and uh, you only have to validate that proof once, um, which is very useful. Um, and then uh, an actual standard for a confidential token, a digital asset, because that's uh, uh, so that you can have some degree of interoperability so that these digital assets can all communicate with one another and you can trade them through a standard interface like confidential transfer and confidential transfer from. I'll get to that in a minute. And obviously really good dev tools that abstract away all of the cryptography so that using this stuff is as simple as you know, um, like signing an ECDAC signature using a typical library. Uh, you don't actually have to understand how on earth that happens to, um, to trust that it works and that it's easy. So this cryptography engine, um, this is culminated in a kind of a, an ERC proposal, um, 1723, all the, all the good numbers were taken. Um, so this is, um, uh, this is our version one fa um, family of ASTEC zero knowledge proofs um, that enable this, this kind of customizable semantics and cross asset interoperability. Um, so we have a kind of a joint split proof for uh, unilateral transfers of value. So um, if I have an encrypted 
balance, I can send somebody some of my encrypted balance. Um, a bilateral swap, which is two, people, two counterparties trading digital, different digital assets. Um, and then the other proofs are kind of utility proofs that you might need for specific like, niche use cases. So for example, a dividend computation proof. So you can prove that, say, one encrypted number is worth 3% of another encrypted number. And you can do things like interest payments that way. Um, and we use this quite extensively in our loan app. Um, and then public and private range shifts for things like, you know, if you have um, an exchange that has a minimum order threshold, a minimum trade threshold, you can prove that, you know, I have a trade, but it's, it's bigger than your, your um, you know, bigger than 10, 20, whatever. Um, you, we also have range proofs over private variables um, if you um, uh, need that for, for, for some purpose. Um, and so these are the gas costs at the moment. And so you can see these are, um, we worked really hard <laughs> to get these under 1 million gas. Um, and so every single one of these proofs right now um, will uh, um, be under a dollar um, using like, typical gas prices. Um, with the Istanbul hub fork that's planned, there is an EIP that's going to reduce these by a factor of between six and eight, uh, which is very exciting for us because then this stuff becomes like, quite competitive with things like an ERC20 token transfer. Um, so uh, we shall hopefully massively expand like, the kind of potential use cases from this for this. So as I mentioned before, the token standard, um, the interface is ERC20-like. Um, that was quite deliberate. Um, so to kind of try and make this as familiar as possible, you can see instead of you know transfer and transfer from, it has confidential transfer and confidential transfer from, um, where you can then um, customize the actual like um, zero knowledge proofs that are validated in these transfer statements to have your kind of custom logic. Um, yeah, um, and I'm showing a bit some of the kind of how this how this can all blend together into an actual um, coherent product. So the core of the Aztec protocol um, is the idea of this balancing relationship. So uh, how do you actually get a public blockchain to validate um, the legitimacy of a transfer without actually having any knowledge or information about what's inside it? Um, the, the answer is you um, use it like a, um, uh, well, this is a strong split transaction. And specifically, um, we represent value a little bit differently to how it's typically represented in Ethereum. Instead of having account balances, um, we have these UTXO, this UTXO model, a bit like Bitcoin, where each UTXO object is an Aztec note. And a note contains an owner, and it contains a value, but the value is encrypted. And the way that you can um, have a smart contract validate a transfer is by having some input notes and some output notes and serving a zero knowledge proof that the sum of the values of the input notes is equal to the sum of the values of the output notes. Um, if this is validated, then the smart contract in question will destroy the input notes, remove it from the, from the relevant state variables, and then add the output notes. Um, and this prevents double spending uh, because you can't, uh, because you, you ensure that you know, what goes in must go out. Um, the only um, wiggle room you have is there is a kind of a public input and a public output, and these represent ERC20 tokens. Um, so you can say, uh, for example, you can have server zero knowledge proof where you have some zero knowledge input notes and zero knowledge output notes, and you can say, hey, look, the output notes are worth 50 more than the input notes, and then you can make up that deficit by adding in public tokens. Um, and that's how you kind of get public value into the crypto system. Um, something else that was really important to mention, really important, is in, yeah. So it's not an MPC because this is, this is entirely non-interactive. Um, the idea is if you, if you own some Aztec notes and you want to send somebody some value, you can construct the Aztec notes that you want to give to that person, um, and then you can construct the required zero-knowledge proof that performs this transcript transaction, um, send it to a verification smart contract and, um, on the Ethereum blockchain, and it can validate that proof. There's no kind of layers of communication required. It's all just um, one way. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> the really important thing here, range proofs. So um, anybody who's dabbled with homomorphic arithmetic um, will have run into the fact that you can, on a elliptic curve, it's relatively easy to like, um, perform simple mathematics on encrypted variables, like additions and subtractions and some multiplications. However, um, all the arithmetic you do is modulo a really large prime number. So um, in an encrypted world, if you have a ver verification smart contract that is um, validating these homomorphic relationships, 
it can't tell the difference between positive and negative numbers. And when you're dealing with money, that's kind of a problem. Um, because, for example, if you have an input note worth zero and two output notes worth one and minus one, that's mathematically legitimate. But that output note that's worth minus one actually is worth um, p minus one, which is like two to the 254. Um, so yeah, you could create more money than exists in the observable universe, which is a problem. Um, so you need a range proof to get around that. And that range proof is kind of the kind of the, um, the bane of a lot of crypto systems because it is traditionally very expensive to do. Um, and I, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself there because that's in a few slides. Um, how do we all put this together? I've just talked about all these things, crypto engine, ZK assets, like blah. But like, like how do you actually create a piece of software that you can like, uh, proverbially hold in your hands? Um, well, this is kind of an example of, of flow, of how this all actually fits together into something a little bit more coherent. Um, and this describes the flow of a user who wants to enact a bilateral trade. So they have, they have a, you know, you have um, two counterparties that both want, they have notes from assets A and B and they want to trade them. So um, the person calling this um, system of smart contracts will have uh, some proof data. So they will have constructed their quite Aztec zero knowledge proof that proves a bilateral swap. Um, and they will talk to, so this is ZKDAP, smart contract is a stand-in for a confidential decentralized exchange that validates bilateral swap proofs. Um, when it receives this proof, um, it's going to query ACE, uh, the Aztec cryptography engine, with an basically query um, validate the proof, determine whether it's legitimate. Um, ACE then will, in turn, um, it will have a repertoire of validator smart contracts, verification algorithms for all of the proofs in our proof family. Um, and um, if the proof is valid, ACE will tell the ZK that this is the case. And this is something which is quite important that what ACE does is it doesn't just validate zero knowledge proofs, it converts zero knowledge proof data into transfer instructions um, that um, conform to a, a kind of a specification that is um, understandable by a smart contract as opposed to like proof, zero knowledge proof data, which is kind of a little bit more amorphous. Um, once the ZKDAP has received those transfer instructions, it can then, well, it can then forward those transfer instructions to the two relevant zero knowledge assets in question. But here's where you run into a bit of a problem because these zero knowledge assets, if you just give them transfer instructions, you know, destroy these notes, make these notes, it doesn't know that those transfer instructions are legitimate. It doesn't know that they conform to the, the semantics of, it, of, the, um, of the zero knowledge proof in question. Normally, this is where both ZK ERC20A and ZK ERC20B would have to validate a zero knowledge proof of their own. Um, and this would be a problem on Ethereum because that bilateral swap proof costs 800,000 gas and that's already pretty, pretty damn efficient. But if you have to do that three times, um, just to do a basic transfer like this, then that starts to very, very quickly become completely impractical. But um, we can cheat, kind of, um, because the cryptography engine knows that the bilateral swap proof is a superset of the zero knowledge proof that these two assets require. And so it know, it, when it validated that original bilateral swap proof, it recorded that in its state ver registry. So it knows, it knows what transfer instructions it spat out as a result of that proof. So when these two digital assets query the cryptography engine with these transfer instructions, go, hey, I was, you know, I was given this random instruction by some smart contract that I have no idea about. Um, what do I do with it? Ace will know, it'll, it'll know. It'll say, yes, this is actually a valid, this came out from a valid proof. This is, this transaction, this transfer instruction, satisfies a valid balancing relationship. So this proof is mathematically legitimate, if anything else. Um, and then, armed with that information, these, then these ZK assets, they can then, now that they know the transfer can happen, they can determine whether it should happen. So that's where you can do things like permissioning, so ensure that the relevant digital signatures have been signed, so that the owners of the Aztec notes have both, like, are on board with this transfer, that they're okay with what's going on. Um, once that step has been validated, it can then Command Ace to update the relevant note registries. So both of these assets will have, um, have a, like a bespoke note registry inside Ace um, that will contain the state variables of all the unspent notes. Um, and armed with the transfer instruction, then those state variables can be updated correctly so that this trade can go through. Um, having Ace control the state is extremely important for um, one real key reason, and that's the um, you, ha you have an ironclad guarantee that the note registries controlled by ACE are like, mathematically legitimate. There's been no double spending. There's been no um, like, arbitrary creation and destruction of value. And this is really important if you want to denominate one digital asset relative to another one. So for example, imagine you're doing some kind of, I don't know, some airdrop or something. You're making a new digital asset and you're saying, okay, anybody who has zero knowledge die, they can mint um, confidential tokens in my new digital asset. Great. Um, that, that becomes a lot more relevant if you know that 
that the asset you're denominating your new asset to hasn't had any double spending. Um, and so that's why ACE kind of controls the state variables there. Um, and so that flow, this thing, it does look a little bit complicated, just because it is. <laughs> but um, let's just consider what's going on here. There is a zero knowledge DAP that performs bilateral tr trades um, of private digital assets. ZK ERC20A and ZK ERC20B are smart contracts that have no idea of each other's existence. They don't know about the ZK DAP. Neither ZK DAP nor ZK ERC20A or B know anything about the actual state variables that they control. They don't know how much each node has. Um, and despite all of this, they can all coordinate together um, to perform this, this transfer, this trade. Um, and this entire process costs us about 800,000 gas. And when the uh, EIP 1108 goes through, that'll cost about like 200,000 gas um, for a completely like confidential encrypted transfer value on Ethereum. And so, yeah. Enter, 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 a uh, few milliseconds. So the proof construction is incredibly, um, uh, what's the word, fast, a um, few milliseconds. The verification runtimes, um, I mean, for a good algorithm, you could get it down into, it's like, um, like 16 scalar multiplications and one by linear pairing. How long would it take and from 1 to 16? Um, like milliseconds, um, literally. Uh, this is, so, um, validating the zero knowledge proof requires about uh, f four, sorry, four notes, three scalar multiplications, twelve scalar multiplications. Um, so you can like you, you know you blink and you must it. That's that's it's it's kind of a trivial amount of um, compute time, and all the rest of it is just updating state variables, calling smart contracts. Um, yeah, we're, we're talking milliseconds, um, both for proof construction and verification. So um, the actual bilateral swap proof costs. 500,000 gas. Um, you can add about another 100,000 for fiddling around with all the state variables, and then maybe like, I don't know, like 100,000 for the, uh, all the other overheads. So about 700k. Um, so all in. Which is, um, yeah, we spent a long time kind of optimizing this like as fast as, as, as much as we could do to the very bone. We even wrote our own elliptic curve scaling multiplication algorithm. It's a smart contract because the precompiles were not uh, like to get a cost that was lower than the beacon pass. Um, this is really as, like, for as, as good as we can get it. Um, so, ah, here we go. This is our loan DAP. So, um, um, what this is doing is this is, this is um, interfacing to a smart contract that creates private loans. So, if you were to look inside the actual um, uh, like transaction logs for, these, for the transaction that creates these smart contracts, um, you wouldn't be able to see um, the size of the loan, who owns it, uh, well, you, you might well, use self addresses, but you may be able to see who owns it, but you won't be able to see how much they own. Um, and so, for example, what's happening here is that the borrower and the lenders are sending view requests. Um, basically, the borrower is permissioning in people to actually view the contents of the loan and view, um, view the encrypted information. Um, and here, Joe's trying to settle the loan, um, and he can't because he doesn't have any money. So, we have a um, this is just a little um, a kind of a um, What's this? this is a zero, zero knowledge proof to send to send 10,000 die to Joe. But this isn't just any ordinary 10,000 die. This is 10,000 zero knowledge die. No one can see what's inside, um, and so no one now knows that Joe has 10,000 die. And when Joe decides to um, withdraw draw down from the loan, um, so this is now the borrower actually, not Joe, um, withdrawing value out of the loan. No one can see how much they've withdrawn um, at all. Uh, no one can see how much interest um, they've collected. No one can see anything about the actual like hard numbers inside this loan. Everything is encrypted. And all of this, all these transactions that are happening, all of the little spinny time, that, that, that latency, that's, that's to actually communicate with an Ethereum node. That's not latency to construct the zero knowledge proof. Um, the proofs are instant, pretty much. Um, and um, so we've used a combination of our like joint split proofs, bilateral swap proofs, I believe, and the dividend P proof to um, create a private loan with streamable interest. So um, in real time, pretty much, or well, block by block, you can compute um, how much interest uh, you're due if you are a lender. Um, and then you can um, withdraw that quantum of interest from the loan um, without revealing anything about how much you've withdrawn. Um, uh, and the, but the smart contract will validate the kind of mathematical legitimacy of all of, all of this. Um, and so yeah, that's kind of, um, this is kind of where we want to, where, where, like this is the kind of, we want to, 
um, put tools into the hands of, of, of every developer and build on Ethereum to do this kind of stuff because um, we think that this can open up an enormous number of potential app like applications for Ethereum, um, applications where, which traditionally have been restricted from public blockchains because of sensitivity around surrounding data, um, that, where this is now no longer the case. So, um, about that efficient range proof. So this is, this is, um, this is a zero knowledge meetup. And, and we use zero knowledge cryptography. And I'm going to talk about zero knowledge cryptography. So um, I believe the, uh, uh, soon the doors will lock and I will have my captive audience <laughs> to talk about this. But basically, um, how do we do what I just showed? Uh, how does it all happen? Um, we need range proofs and we need fast range proofs. And so what we've done with the asset protocol is we've combined um, a commitment function, so um, like a, a, a commitment to an encrypted number, we combine that with um, a kind of an implicit range proof, um, so that by serving a range proof um, over a, um, a commitment is exactly the same thing as proving you know an opening to the commitment, um, so, uh, which neatly kills two birds with a bill stone, which we really needed to do to make this um, efficient enough to use on Ethereum. So we use a trusted setup, but all proofs use the same common reference string, and the common reference string Created by the trusted setup, it's a it's basically a subset of it's a subset of both powers of tau and the sonic trusted setup ceremony, um, and so we're currently putting some of the some some kind of touches to our trusted setup ceremony software um, to to run the ceremony, and we've kind of um, thrown it, added the uh, sonic um, pro proving uh, the structure referencing for sonic as well because we think it'll be quite. Uh, valuable in the long term because sonic is a fantastic um, piece of technology that we want to integrate into Aztec, so. Um, you can use this commitment function to enable efficient and modular and useful sigma protocols. Um, so um, sigma protocols like basic, um, uh, like uh, three-step zero-knowledge proofs to prove um, s relatively simple algebraic relationships between commi commitments. Um, once you have range proof, then the actual, um, the remaining logic you need to, to enable these sigma protocols for quite advanced, um, like mathematical statements, is is quite minimal. So. Um, at its core, the asset protocol is uh, a polynomial commitment scheme, like, um, like pretty much every, everything these days. Um, so if you have a polynomial expressive of a prime field, um, and you evaluate that polynomial over an elliptic curve, then if you have two scalars in the finite field of the um, exponent of the elliptic curve, then um, for those two scalars, the difference between the two will perfectly divide um, the evaluation of the polynomial at those two scalars. Um, and the, you can efficiently compute the coefficients of said polynomial. Um, and this is really useful because you can use it to construct proofs of knowledge. Specifically, our range proof polynomial is quite simple, simple as it gets, really. It's just a product of um, x minus i, where i ranges from 0 to n. Um, and the idea is that we commit to, you commit to this polynomial, um, evaluated over a secret um, scalar y, which is created during the trust setup, so it's, to it's um, part of the toxic waste that the ceremony needs to destroy. Um, and this point we call H um, because we use it like a generator, and we can use it like a generator because the mapping between H and a traditional generator, G, um, well, it contains lots of terms in Y, um, and so if Y is being destroyed, then you, you, there, there is no efficiently computable mapping between G and H, and so you can treat them like generators. Um, and then you have this, we, if you commit to, well, the generator, um, and then this um, group element mu, which is the evaluation of this polynomial at y, divided by y minus k. For some k, where the evaluation of k, of the polynomial at k is zero. So basically, if k is between zero and n, um, and you commit to h and mu, then if and only if the poly this polynomial evaluates to zero, then this relationship will be true. Then mu multiplied by y minus k. Um, uh, sorry, that should be my minus k uh, typo. Sorry, um, yeah, uh, y minus k is going to equal to the generator. Um, to put it another way, you can rearrange this into a really simple binary pairing check, um, k, uh, where you um, have your mu and then h dot mu to the k. Um, and if you can satisfy this relationship, then you've proven that um, mu hides, well, um, contains k, um, as in, in the, you can, uh, in its kind of, um, in the, in the divisor term. Um, and this is really useful because you can then use this in, um, you can add zero knowledge into this um, to create a commitment to an integer that is between zero and n, i.e. a range proof, um, to kind of expand on this. So in the trusted setup ceremony, you generate g to the y, y squared, et cetera, up to y to the n, where n is the maximum 
um, integer in your range. Um, why is toxic waste that you need to destroy? And so you can use, you, like, um, uh, Mary did, you know, gave a fantastic explanation of like how this trust ceremony will be performed, um, and the, the idea that it's updatable. It's basically, it's, it is literally just a subset of this of the of this of the points that Sonic requires. Um, and you compute this generator. Um, so this this step here is kind of what we call a, the post-processing step for our trusted setup. So these computations need to be performed once by one person who is not trusted, because you can verify that this has been done correctly. So you compute this, this kind of the generator polynomial that your range proofs are going to be computed relative to. And then you compute, compute these elliptic curve points, which are kind of the signature points you need to prove to serve range proofs. So there are n of them. And all they are is it's just this polynomial equation, but with one term missing, like the term that you actually want to serve range proof server. And so, um, and the amount of computation you need to perform to actually get this database of points is relatively intense. It's order n squared, but you only have to do it once. So that's not such a big deal. Um, once you have those two, once you have that database of points, then if you want to commit to a range, an integer within a range, you select the relevant mu from the database. Of, um, and the idea is the database needs, needs to be made available. Um, and you generate some random scalar, um, which kind of acts as your, your, your um, to uh, blind, to, to, to hide the um, uh, data in your commitment. Um, and also acts as a viewing key. So if you know A, you can decrypt your commitment. Um, and then you compute this commitment, this tuple of elliptic curve points, where gamma is just mu multiplied by A, and sigma is your point gamma multiplied by K, added together with H to the A. Um, and if we skip back to the other slide, group, so you can see here, basically what we've done here is um, gamma is mu to the A. We've basically just taken that binary pairing check and we just multiplied everything up by A um, on, one, on the left-hand side. Um, and that adds a level of, um, that adds the hiding property to the commitment scheme, which is fantastic because that's, you know, a commitment scheme isn't a commitment scheme if it's not hiding. Um, and that sigma, that's really the, um, the kind of the uh, encryption of K um, that is useful because if you kind of squint until you had a bit, it looks like a Pedersen commitment. Um, and that's how we treat them. The idea being, if you can prove that you know an opening to the tuple gamma and sigma, such that sigma is gamma multiplied by k added together with h multiplied by a. If you can prove that, and you can satisfy this bilinear pairing check, then you know implicitly that this tuple of elliptic curve points is a commitment to an integer that is within the range 0 to n. And you can do that with three elliptic curve scalar multiplications and one bilinear pairing. However, um, regardless of the number of, you can have an arbitrary number of um, commitments that you're opening, and you only ever need one bilinear pairing. So that, that kind of term, that part is, con is fixed. Um, so yeah, it's uh, pretty, pretty efficient as far as commitment schemes go, particularly ones that use range proofs. Um, and we use this kind of as the core of um, the ASIC protocol, SIG protocols, because once you have this efficient range proof, then um, the signal protocols to prove like various algebraic relationships, like this balancing relationship, the sum of the inputs, this is some of the inputs, or dividend computations, or range proofs, or anything. Um, they're all just relatively straightforward signal protocols that don't need any additional um, like trusted setup elements in their common reference strings. Um, and so, as we ad develop and advance the protocol, we can add more innovative and uh, like um, niche signal protocols to perform niche bits of business logic that are that are desired and needed in order to deploy like the applications um, that people want to use Aztec for. So, yeah, um, that's kind of the kernel of it. And then, yeah, so I've, I've already kind of gone over this. Um, if you want to, you know, if you, if you want to open a commitment, you prove knowledge, you prove knowledge of those t the witnesses K and A, such as, so that is true. Um, and then you perform this by any pairing check. And hey, presto, you have your, um, you, you validated that, the, um, that gamma sigma hides an integer that is within a range. So I've been mentioning sigma protocols on and off. Um, it's a kind of a slightly older technology, um, zero-knowledge technology, than, than a lot of the other crypto systems out there. Um, it's, um, it's been around for a while. Um, it's, uh, you can use them to express, to prove like algebraic formula like directly expressed over the, in the exponent of an elliptic curve. So a snark circuit, for example, something like a quadratic arithmetic program, will the actual kind of the, the um, 
the exponent of your elliptic curve represents a polynomial equation uh, which um, uh, encodes uh, like the constraints in your circuit. And so you, the kind of the the mapping between the logic that you're trying to validate and the actual um, like uh, data that you're expressing in your elliptic curve points. Um, uh, is, doesn't really map one to one, whereas the Sigma protocol is much more direct. Um, they have everything has its trade-offs and its benefits. Um, they're really simple to construct and prove. However, the computation runtime does scale linearly with the number of statements that you want. So, for example, with the ASIC protocol, the more notes you add into your join split transaction, the, the larger the runtimes become. However, the kind of the constant multi the, the multiplication factor is extremely small because the like the, the actual amount of work you need to perform per note is really tiny. Um, and yeah, uh, different proofs can share the same common reference string, and you can just add extra sigma protocols over time. So, how do you how do you get stuck in? Uh, say you want to build a private digital asset today on mainnet right now. Um, well, we have all of our um, kind of tech in its very latest form in our Aztec monorepo. So that has our like um, the JavaScript libraries we use to construct and verify our zero knowledge proofs. It has our smart contracts um, and templates for things like the. Um, templates like for private digital assets, how they interact with the cryptography engine, um, as well as kind of as well as um, all of our smart contracts uh, deployed to, uh, to all the main test nets. If you want to play around, so yeah, if you want to get involved, you want to get stuck in, um, that's the place to go. So um, yeah, this is kind of just a, a, a retelling of the previous slide. Um, we have a getting started tutorial at uh, in our Medium publication, um, written by Paul. Pardon? Oh, you, it was public now. Yeah. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. I thought it was still private. Okay. Yeah. Well, on our GitHub repo, we have the loan app. So clone it, check it out, play around with it, please. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, if, this, if this stuff speaks to your heart, if you, if you, if you have a yearning for privacy uh, in, a, in a world where it's all too, too um, uh, no longer taken for granted, uh, then this is, hopefully this is your ticket. Um, I think that is pretty much it. Um, this is our roadmap. Very happy and pleased to put some ticks next to this Q1 uh, um, milestones, given that it's Q2. Um, so yeah, we are um, planning on finishing, uh, well, starting and finishing our trust to set up multi-party computation in Q2, um, putting the finishing touches to our algorithms uh, this week. Um, and we also want to um, begin to formally verify um, the kind of the critical sections of our ASIC smart contracts, the verification smart contracts and the logic that they contain. Because we, um, we have um, like the, the actual zero knowledge product proofs themselves are sound um, and honest verified zero knowledge, but um, we do want to validate that the code is an accurate expression of the mathematics. Um, and then in Q3, we'll be gearing up for our production grade mainnet release, um, so to really take this off the test nets and um, like put our stamp of approval on it and say that we're confident that this stuff is ready to be used in a production environment. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Good question. So um, that really depends on the output of our trusted setup MPC, because the processing step um, is order n squared. So it only needs to be performed once, but we were planning on a range of 100 million, uh, and so I realized that that's going to take 10 quadrillion elliptical scaling multiplications, which is kind of a bit too many. Um, so we're planning, we're targeting a range of 50 million. However, you can use, in the same way like in a bulletproof zero, um, proof, you commit to um, bits, you prove each bit is zero or one, and then you can concatenate them together. But well, you can do the same with Aztec proofs. So um, you can take a range of between zero and say two to the um, like 25, um, and then just have two notes, um, one for high limit and one for low limit, and then you have a 50 bit range proof. So. If you're willing to double up on the on the verification time, then you can then you then you can take our range from um, 50 million to 50 log to 50 million um, squared or something. Um, no, not that. To, sorry, 50, I, I, I can't I can't represent 50 million base two, but like like two to the 50. Um, Yeah. Well, um, so. <laughs> yeah. 
a lot of audits, but also, um, so we made a very deliberate distinction between, in, if you have an asset note, you have a viewing key and a spending key. Um, your viewing keys need to decrypt in the note and construct zero knowledge proofs, but the spending keys require to sign the digital signatures needed for smart contracts to actually process your transactions. And so you can give your viewing keys to auditors, regulators, to anybody you want, and all you lose is um, like the, the, anybody with a viewing key can see what's going on, but they don't have any ability to like spend or your notes. So um, yeah, you, if, you, if you need to do KYC or AML, you can just literally give the viewing keys to the, to the um, responsible authorities. I get how you do token transfers, but if, um, how would you do like, um, is this, um, um, can you use this for arbitrary data? So can you keep arbitrary data um, private rather than for token transfer? Yeah, you can keep arbitrary data private with this. Um, I think it's for arbitrary data, um, if you don't need to perform any kind of like logic um, on the encrypted data, then you, then you're better off just encrypt, just straight up just encrypting it, um, because you don't need you don't need any of the kind of additional like mechanics of like homomorphic encryption and zero and what, what you get with Aztec. Um, so we did we did kind of tailor this very much for like, um, like mathematical operations over integers and values because that's where we think we can add the most value. Yes. I don't know. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, just, um, yeah, I should probably just say Dr. Williamson or Zach. Just call me Zach. Yeah. Zach. yeah. Great. Um, so I met your uh, other colleagues, um, Tom and Con Lord, at the mm -hmm. Binary District. Um, you said the other week they were very busy. You've got a great team, really smart guys. Thank you. Um, you've probably been asked this question loads of times tonight. If you haven't already, I'll ask this to sort of say you, those people asking you this later on. But sure. The EY Nightfall yes. platform. Do you see that as a direct competitor to what you're doing? If you do, then what? Do you, what's your unique selling point um, compared to what So, when it comes to Nightfall, I think it's fascinating technology, and I don't want to like. Um, what's the word? My own information about Nightfall is relatively incomplete. Um, I they know they released their actual products on Saturday, and I've not really had the time to dig through it myself. I do think that we're trying to, we're, we're kind of meandering our way towards um, a say, like a, trying to achieve similar things through, through very different means. Um, and um, when we put together Aztec, we, there are a lot of like zero knowledge technologies out there that we could have chosen. Um, and um, growth and star snarks and the Pinocchio protocol star snarks before them were, were candidates that we were considering. Um, the reasons we didn't go with those, tech, those um, proving systems was because of, one of them is we wanted to have multiple different zero knowledge proofs that all interfaced with one another. And we didn't want to have to deal with the um, uh, additional mechanics of having to perform trusses headless reach circuit. Um, and we think that's going to become uh, quite, quite apparent the value of that over time because we're planning on, we only have five proofs in our cryptography engine, but that's going to change quite quickly once we reach production. Um, the other constraints that we have on Ethereum are things like, um, well, mostly proof construction time. Um, as, you saw, as I showed you, showed you in that loan app example, proof construction is on the order of milliseconds. You can do it in the browser. It's not, um, it's not, like, it's not any kind of constraint. It doesn't pose any UX problems, whereas with um, a snark, um, particularly like Pinocchio protocol snark, star snarks and gloss star snarks, if you want to perform a, if you want to run a hashing algorithm like SHA-T by 6, so you require 20,000 constraints. So that's at least 20,000 scalar multiplications. So if you're working in a web browser where like maybe if you, if you write a really fast hand-tuned web assembly elliptic curve library, maybe you can get it to like 15 microseconds per scalar multiplication. Then if you want to perform um, SHA-T by 6 over a hash tree, then you're talking at, like at, at the best case scenario, you're talking dozens of seconds. And so to do anything like, qu quite complicated, you're, you're looking at minute runtimes, and that's kind of the, uh, for us that wasn't an acceptable UX, um, particularly because we can't do things like um, batch proofs together, because we're a privacy solution for Ethereum. The idea is the people using us are, um, have from all walks, have different needs, are building different digital assets that all have customizable semantics for the um, transaction semantics, and so their proofs can't be batched. So um, the, the numbers didn't really add up to use ZK Snarks as they were for what we're doing. I'm very excited about technologies in the future, particularly things like Sonic with updatable reference strings. Um, and if we can cut down the proving time so that the, those proofs get like practical in our browser, then we absolutely will start to gravitate towards that. Yep. The, uh, the elliptic curve contract 
Why, why is that cheaper than the pre So, um, when the precompiles were added into Ethereum, um, the implementations that were used by the reference clients, so Parity and Geth, um, they were very much focusing on kind of security of the speed. They wanted to make sure it worked. Um, how quickly it worked wasn't really a priority. And so the gas costs for those precompiled contract calls were pegged relative to the run times of those relatively slow algorithms. And so that's why we got gas costs of like 40,000 gas for ECML and like kind of like 200-ish gas, 1,000 gas for pairings. And so with the smart contract version um, called VStrudel, um, we, like I, I wrote that to kind of take advantage of the fact that um, inside an Ethereum smart contract, like the native word size is 256 bits. And so performing modular multiplication in, a, in an Ethereum smart contract isn't actually as bad as you might think it would be. Like the runtime isn't as bad compared to native code, um, which is the kind of the, um, not the case for pretty much every other code on, on a smart contract. But it does mean that, um, like for a smart contract, for the curve library optimized to the bone for gas, you can get it down to like 25,000 per point as opposed to the 40,000 that current, it currently stands at, at the, with the pre-compile. Thank you very much. It's been a, it's been a pleasure.